Check one, check two. All right, guys. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Did uh, everybody have a good week? Are all the tests really fun? <laughs> and I guess everybody else is having a test next week, too, because of how many people have two tests next week? How many have three? You have three. Somebody told me four. OK. So that hurts. <laughs> Even if it's all basket weaving, that hurts. OK, well, um, next week I'm going to be gone. <laughs> I'm going to China for a meeting. So Keaton and um, Kevin and some of the under mentors will run the meeting. I see Kevin's not here. There's a possibility that we may meet in a different classroom than this one. Uh, to talk about different project ideas or project areas. Um, we're thinking of a classroom where we can separate a little bit more and break into like three or four groups and talk. Uh, but that's not settled yet. Uh, we'll send you an email and let you know. Unless Kevin comes running in and says, I know the classroom. Um, we, we might do it upstairs on the 15th floor in the astronomy department in the large classroom they have up there. Uh, it's reserved. but. It usually doesn't get used. They reserve it for faculty meetings every Friday, but they only have faculty meetings once a month. So I think it's free next Friday. So we might do that. But you'll have to listen uh, for emails from Keaton and uh, Kevin to, to figure that one out. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's going to be two weeks or three weeks, well, two and a half weeks till I'll see you again, because then we have spring break. And then the classes start up again. Well, how many people? enjoyed this lab. OK, that's good. And I appreciate the politeness. <laughs> Even if you didn't enjoy it, I think you raised your hand. Why, what made this somewhat enjoyable? Why was this fun? The visuals. The visuals, yeah, they do help a lot, don't they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's true, when the, when the code first came out, it didn't have any of that. And that got added in like a year and a half ago, and wow, did that make a big difference. Because as you're watching, before you were watching it run just with the terminal output, and you're like, I think this is happening. You know, and then you'd have to say, OK, well, how would I plot this in order to get that, to, to see that? And now it's part of the code. So the, the plots are almost good enough to publish, uh, but they're definitely good enough to look at and try and figure out what's going on. Any other comments about it? No snarky comments like, well, it was written by you know, a professional programmer, so it's actually good. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, some of our other tools are a little shakier. Um, they're good, but they're not the same level. It turns out, I, I, I have hardly any slides on, on, on Mesa. But Mesa, it's open source, so it has lots of contributors. But there's one main guy, and his name is Bill Paxton. He's not the actor Bill Paxton, if anybody remembers that. Um, but he was actually, he has a really interesting history. I can't remember it all. He's a computer, a computer guy. And in the late 70s and early 80s, he worked for various important computer companies like HP, and um, IBM, and he was one of the, he was a co-inventor. I hope people have heard of PostScript. Have you all heard of PostScript? Yeah, well, PostScript, the printer language, or the graphics language. OK, not so much. Well, everything, you know how everything is PDF now? About 10 years ago, everything was PostScript. All documents were PostScript. I exaggerate a little. 15 years ago, everything was PostScript. That's for sure. So he was a co-inventor of PostScript, which is a really huge thing. Uh, oh, and he was, at, he was at Adobe. That was his last thing. So Adobe invented PostScript. They also invented PDF. So around 1990, he retired, basically, because he made a lot of money and he wanted to do something else. 
and he started taking courses. He was an undergrad in physics. He was a physics major at University of Santa Barbara. UCSB. And he got a physics degree, and then he decided, well, maybe I'll go to grad school. So he went to grad school in physics, and he met a guy named Lars Bildston, who's a theoretical astrophysics physicist at UCSB. And Lars said, well, you know, why don't we put your computer programming skills to use? You know, why not write a real simple stellar evolution program that, you know, for undergraduates that they can use? And so Bill Paxton did that. And it was pretty useful. And Lars said, well, you mean, I might want to add a little of this, a little of that. And pretty soon, the code started to get really sophisticated. And about three or four years ago, Lars said, you know what? Why don't you just make the best stellar evolution code in the whole world? We'll make it open source, you know? And I bet you in five years, we can be done. And so that's what they started doing. Um, so you can think of Bill Paxton as like, has anybody heard of Linus Torvalds? You know, the founder in, of Linux. He's the Linu in Linux. Um, Bill Paxton is the Linus Torvalds of Mesa. Everything comes through him. He makes all final decisions. He's the coordinator. He's the gatekeeper. He actually has a lot more influence than Linus does. Um, not, do we have any Linux heads in here? <laughs> Yeah, because you know that Linus does the kernel for Linux, but all the graphical stuff on top is done by other people. It's only the central little computing engine, where Bill Paxton does the whole darn code, everything. Everything from the computations and new numerical algorithms to new physics to new graphical output. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a large thing, but he's really good at it, and he's fortunately a pretty nice guy. Um, very sharp, very goal-oriented. So anyway. MESA stands for, and I misspelled it, modules with an S for experiments in stellar astrophysics. So it was originally designed to be a collection of things that anybody could use for anything. Like there's these things called equation of state. So say I'm given a density and a temperature and a composition. I know it's hydrogen and it's at 10,000 degrees and a density of one gram per cubic centimeter. Then there's a pressure associated with that. And in equation of state, you give it those parameters and it tells you what the pressure is. Um, so that is a module in MESA is the equation of state. And for instance, I've taken that module and I've used that in other codes. So it's like a little thing you can separate out and put it, use it for something else. There's other uh, routines in there that are modular that you can take out. But typically when we say MESA, we really mean when you put all the modules together and make a stellar evolution code. So Technically, that's called Mesa Star. That's the thing you run, but whatever. Oh, and why did I put that on there? Um, so anyway, I only have a few slides, so you guys better ask a lot of questions. Um, and the, the, the mentors better help me out, too, you know, with questions. Um, <clears throat> so here's an HR diagram, a theorist's HR diagram, where you got log temperature increasing this way, log luminosity going this way. And there's a continuum of stars. This, this is, the density of points here is sort of where the density of stars is. There's a lot of low mass stars and there's not as many high mass stars. And the stars tend to linger on the main sequence when they're burning hydrogen. And so you see more of them here. Uh, they also linger over here, but they only spend about a tenth as much time here as they do here, maybe less. Um, so anyway, and what's written in here is a stellar evolution track for a typical four solar mass star starts burning hydrogen here, evolves off and goes over here, and then it seems to do some dipsy doodles. Over here, you got this is what we think the sun will do. It'll go up here, and they truncated the evolution at some point. All right. Well, nobody's asking questions. questions? Yes, thank you. Uh, why <laughs> Why is what? The graph. The oh, you mean why is the temperature backwards? Yeah. Can anybody answer that? It's just a silly thing of astronomy. <laughs> I, think, I think what they did is originally this axis was thought of as color. And so they would literally put blue stars over here and red stars over here. 
and they weren't thinking temperature at all. I, I really think that's the reason. And so somebody just liked red on the right. Yeah? Which is also wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So the idea of crazy was that stars would start out out here and they would contract and they would get dimmer and they would just go down here. Completely, utterly false. Um, but yeah, so maybe that's why it's left to right is it's thought that things go left to right. Why didn't they flip it? <laughs> well, then you'd have to admit you're wrong. <laughs> and you never do that. <laughs> yeah, there's a, yeah, no, you'd certainly like to go back and correct things. I just think of it as local color, you know? It's like, it's like the streets in Austin that aren't straight. You know, like Koenig or something, or Lamar, it just wanders all over. You know, and it's just, it's local color. Um, yeah, that reminds me, um, how many of y'all have read any pop books? Popular books by Feynman. Anybody? You know, surely you must be joking, whatever. Those ones, I forget the other one. Um, what do you care what other people think? Something like that. Well, anyway, he talks about, you know, in high school what he was doing. He was teaching himself calculus, and he would invent new symbols. He wouldn't use the standard symbols for stuff. Like he had a different symbol for integrate and a different one for differentiation and other things. Did he? And he said, though, at some point he realized if he ever wanted to communicate with anybody else, he needed to standardize and use the same symbols that they were using. And unfortunately, that's the situation here. If you flip your HR diagrams, nobody's going to know what the heck you're talking about. So at some point, you know, personal creativity, you, you have to standardize. Anyway, any other questions? <laughs> that's a good one. I wish I had an answer. Um, and it turns out that this is exactly the opposite that would happen. You know, if you really had, so this was before they knew that stars burned hydrogen. So the only way they thought they could shine is by using up the gravitational energy of, you know, contracting. You know, because when things contract, they, they get hotter and generate energy. But even if you take that, so if you take that at face value, then if you start with a big ball of gas like this, it starts off big and cool, right? So this is, this is big and cool. And as it shrinks, it gets hotter and smaller. OK. So first of all, as it shrinks, it's going to get hotter, right? So which way is that in this diagram? Yeah. So. If you believe that argument, things should move this way. And they start out really big, and it turns out that that would make them bright because the bigger something is, the, the brighter it can be. Um, so they would actually start out here and evolve down this way. So it's at completely right angles to um, what really happens. So the fact that they even had the audacity to suggest that is, is really incredible. Uh, it's, it again shows the power of the human spirit. When you, you don't have an explanation, people will come up with the darndest things and believe them. You know, it should have been just patently obvious that, that they had no theory, whereas they simply took the best one they could find lying around that was obviously wrong. Um, there's a moral in there. There's a moral in there for all of us. <laughs> um, so anyway, it is the craziest definition ever. And I think I mentioned this earlier that Given this idea that things evolve like this, they called stars over here early type stars, and these are late type stars. We still use that terminology. So a star in this part of the HR diagram, they will call an early type star, and a star over here they call late. Don't attach any meaning to the words early and late. They would have done much better if they said blue and red. Blue and red would actually be true. You know. It's, so yeah, astronomy is much less logical than almost any other science that I'm aware of, at least compared to physics. Compared to, you know, physicists come along and they're like, okay, we're going to redo all our conventions. Um, but not astronomers. <laughs>
We're conservative. Oh, one, one, one thing that actually is true, though. White dwarfs cool off. They actually do this. White dwarfs actually cool off going to the right. So there must be something different about a white dwarf, right? What's different about a white dwarf so that this picture doesn't apply to? What's that? That's true, but in the, in the goofball case I made up of star that starts off on the upper right and goes to the lower left, there was no fusion either. So what's different here? Slightly tricky. What's that? No, not really. It's not shrinking. Yeah, white dwarfs, as they cool off, they don't get smaller and smaller. They stay basically the same size. So what do we know about an object? If it's got the same size, but it's hotter, is it brighter or dimmer? And so as it cools off and stays the same size, it gets dimmer. Right? So that object really would go from, from here down to here. Whereas in the other case, it starts off cooler, you know, and it, it gets hotter, so it ought to get brighter, but the radius goes down so much that it, that it makes up for it, that it makes a net loss in luminosity. Does anybody know how the luminosity of the star, the radius, and the effective temperature are related? Forget the constants, but do you know the sort of proportionality? So if I make the radius bigger, the star is brighter, right? If I make the temperature bigger, the star is brighter, right? Okay, and more quantitatively, how does the luminosity depend on the radius and the temperature? Let's, let's do the t uh, radius first. How should it depend on the radius? R squared, surface area, right? So L is going to be proportional to R squared. And then if you're like me, you heard this in high school chemistry, I think. Um, how does the brightness of a, a unit of area at a certain temperature go with the temperature? How does it vary? Somebody else. T to the fourth, kind of. So I should use little twiddles around here. <laughs> Maybe it's 4.2 or 3.8. It turns out it's 4.0. T to the 4. So if you make the radius twice as big and keep the temperature constant, how much brighter does the luminosity get? And if you do keep the radius constant and make the temperature twice as much brighter, how much brighter does it get? Yeah, that's a lot. That's why, um, yeah, that, so that makes a huge difference. So anyway, this is really another fundamental equation um, in astronomy. Because when we talk about a star's color, we're really talking about its temperature. And if we know its temperature, then we're halfway to knowing how bright it is. The only other thing we need to know is the radius in order to know how intrinsically bright it is. And remember, in astronomy, we don't know how far our stars are, how far away they are. So we don't know how intrinsically bright any of them are. So we're really looking for things that will tell us how bright they actually are so we can get their distances. Um, and things like this help. All right, good questions. Oh yeah, yeah, we've, as Don likes to point out, all these little hashed areas are where we've found pulsating white dwarf stars, and all of these classes of stars have been found here at UT. Yay! Out at West Texas by Don and Ed Nather and collaborators and students. All right, so you guys used MESA this week. Um, I did something really dumb today. I forgot my backpack at home, and so I forgot my computer. So I had to borrow Keaton's computer. So I was actually going to do a MESA run for you, but that can't happen. Well, yes, but. <laughs> the odds of me uh, figuring it out five minutes before class are not very good. Um, so this is a standard movie from the MESA website. Um, and what was the, there were four stages you guys were supposed to go through. Did ever, how many of y'all made it to the actual fourth stage? You know, where you were, what, burning helium? 
or no, exhausted helium. Or you exhausted helium in the core. So a few of you. Well, why not exhaust oxygen? Well, you could. Did, did anybody get that far? All right. How about silicon? <laughs> so you, did you get to having silicon in the core, though? Yeah, OK. How, how massive were those stars? 30 solar mass. 16? Wow. OK. Well, they should all make it if they're above 10. I think all of them, if they're above 10 or 12, should all, all eventually burn silicon. But of course, it takes longer and longer on the computer. All right, well, let's see if I can let this thing go. It's, um, it's a one solar mass model. And I think y'all were doing 1.1 solar masses, some of y'all. And let's see. So here it's contracting down, and it's becoming Whoops. Damn it. <laughs> Damn it, Jim. I can't pause it without... Yeah, hang on. Let, let's do this. Yeah, that won't work, will it? If I run it here... Well, close to here is when the hydrogen burning luminosity equals the luminosity at the surface. So, if you've got a star, if, if you've got a star like this, it started out big and contracting, right? And just the fact that it was contracting generated heat for it, generated luminosity. Um, so even, even before you had really any significant hydrogen burning, the star was really pretty bright, right? You know, several times as bright as the sun is today. Um, and so the hydrogen luminosity was much smaller than that. Eventually, though, you start burning stuff in here, according to the PP chain. Um, and then you're generating some hydrogen luminosity out of the core and you're getting some luminosity out the surface of the star. Now eventually when things reach equilibrium, you're going to have these two things be about equivalent. So everybody got this, right? This was the first thing. Hopefully on every star you got this far. If not, it was a failure. All right. And then the, the irony is, the really long time it spends on the main sequence, it, Mesa just shoots through that. You know, because the structure of the star hardly even changes in a billion years. Hardly changes. And so, you can, numerically, you can take steps that are one gig a year. All right, so now we're burning uh, hydrogen in the center. Oh, we burned it all. Oh, the model's 12 billion years old. Yeah. What? It's, <laughs> it's never been on the screen? No. Oh, it's your notebook. Sorry. Never mind. You can take that window and bring it. Uh, never mind. <laughs> we'll just watch it go. OK, it's more fun this way anyway. So <laughs> you guys are really patient. <laughs> All right, so we're getting down with the where they even. Boom, it's on the main sequence. And it's 7 billion years old. No, it's 11, it's 12. OK. That was quick. You should do horse races. <laughs> Horses aren't this fast. <laughs> All right, so you got 98% helium in the core. Um, but it's going up the red giant branch. So interestingly, there's, no, there's not a similar plot. One plot I'd like to see in Mesa is the core and the envelope of a star do different things. So when you go off the main sequence, the core actually shrinks. It goes down, whereas the envelope expands. You know, it gets huge. And so two different things are happening. There's no way to actually see um, that going on. Oh, and it looks like it's burning helium now. Let's see, is it? Not? Well, it's thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, it's thinking about it. Look, 
I guess it's not burning that much, but the helium luminosity is uh, significant. It's going to start again. It looked like it just did a sort of kind of flash. Um, these are nuclear energy generation rates right here. So when this spikes, it means a lot of burning is going on there. So I think it's spiking again. And if you look at energy from triple alpha, well, it isn't that much. It's, well, it's, hang on, it's three and a half, four. Yeah, so it's, it's really going. The funny thing is, is the core of the star is getting bright, dim, bright, dim, bright, dim. And the surface is staying kind of constant. It's because, you know, the surface has some sort of thermal inertia. And so while this is doing this, uh, you don't see it at the surface. It's kind of funny. In this program, do binaries? Yes. Yes, it can. So anyway, uh, one thing I should have pointed out, it started out at 1.0 solar masses. It's down to 0.8 solar masses. So while all this is occurring, there's a wind out from the star. And that's included as a parameterization. So if you're able to run this all the way to conclusion, well, actually, this is going to. What happened? Oh, yeah, we burned it up. Yeah, you know what happened is it eventually got warm enough in the core to where it could burn it statically. So it was like a helium main sequence. And so then it could take large time steps again and just plow through the helium. It'd be completely the opposite in the real star. It would spend most of the time sitting there just burning the helium quietly. Just like on the main sequence, it burns the hydrogen quietly. So it's completely the opposite. It's, it's sort of like a, if the star is sort of like a race car, you know, it, it goes straight and fast for a long time. And that's really easy to compute what's going on. But then when these other things start happening, it's doing all these twisty turns. The code itself has to slow down to follow it along all these twists and turns. So it gets slow. So it gets slowest in the um, phases of the evolution that in real time go by the fastest. Um, so yeah, the sun spends 10 billion years down here and maybe a few hundred million years up here uh, doing this stuff. Yeah, and so right now we're down to, we're down, the mass is down to 0.7. Um, now the way mass loss is incorporated in MESA and every other stellar, stellar evolution code is it's just sort of parameterized. As the star gets bigger and brighter, we say that it starts losing mass because stars do. We don't have a good physical model for that, but we can see, we can see that the stars that come from the main sequence here where they have a certain mass, by the time they get up here, they have slightly less mass. All right, so now this star is actually starting to think about cooling off. Um, so it's still burning a lot. There's a lot of hydrogen burning and a lot of helium burning going on, uh, not in the center, but in a shell. Um, but the surface is starting to cool off. And so it's moving, I'm sorry, it's starting to heat up. Um, Oh, and now it's cooling off quite a bit and see if it, no, oh, can't do it. <laughs> so it got down here and started to contract and in the interior it heated back up and that caused nuclear reactions to start a little bit hotter and so then it re-expanded. And now it's gonna try and basically do the same thing again. Um, it keeps going until it gets it? Until it cools off enough that it can keep going. Yep. Oh. But now I think it may just go. <laughs> or not. <laughs> and unfortunately, the white dwarf cooling track part, it just shoots through that because that's so easy. So that's, if you blink, you miss that. So it's getting ready to do it. Get ready to do it. Oh my goodness, it's a white dwarf. Yay, it's a white dwarf. 10,000 degrees, 7,000 degrees, 6,000 degrees. There we are. And this probably took one, a half a billion or a billion years to do this last little part. Um, the total age, no, maybe it took two. The total age of the star is 14.4 billion years. Does anybody know what's wrong with that number? It is indeed. So if this were to apply to the real universe, the star would have had to stop cooling off around here. It wouldn't have had time to do this last bit. So that's kind of fun. So anyway, if you run MESA for long enough, this can happen to you. Um, so we started out at one solar mass and we wound up with 0.54 solar masses. So the star lost almost half of its mass. We think the sun's gonna do that. 
We think all stars do that. Um, eight solar mass stars lose like 80 or 90 percent of their mass before they become white dwarfs. Um, and stars less massive than the sun don't lose half their mass, but all stars lose a heck of a lot of mass. Yeah. Is the mass parameterized because... You mean the mass loss? Mass loss parameterized because uh, it's not necessarily an isolated system at that point when you have mass loss. The mass loss is going somewhere, but it's not within the actual bound of the star. Yeah, yeah, we just say it leaves the star. So you really just take mass off the surface of the star. In reality, we think that radiation somehow picks up the atoms and carries them out. It like blows off the atoms. But we don't know exactly how that works. And magnetic fields may be necessary for that to really work. I mean, the sun has a solar wind. And so what you, you can think of this mass loss as like an enhanced wind that's 1,000 or 10,000 times greater than a solar wind. Um, I think the sun, over its entire lifetime on the main sequence, though, it won't lose like a thousandth of its solar mass in the solar wind. It's a really tiny amount. Yeah. Uh, you said that the, the solar wind must pick up some of the mass, uh, but how much of the mass is lost that energy is degraded, radiated out as photons? Well, energy is always coming out as photons. It's just that it carries away a little bit of mass with it sometimes. Yeah, I'm really, really waving my hands here. Um, here's a star. Or here's a picture of a star. You know, and it may be that you have to have a star with a magnetic field. Well, of course, they all have magnetic fields. But it may be that it may be that you lose mass preferentially along magnetic field lines out of the poles. You know, so that the mass loss in this direction isn't as big as the mass loss over here. We just don't have a good theory for this. Um, so we, but we see that stars must be losing mass, so we stick it in. You know, we just put it in there. Yeah, JJ. Well, that was a really good question about because nuclear <coughs> generation is by definition the stars losing mass to radiation. Well, that's that true too. Right? Yeah. I'm and sorry, I misunderstood. Or the, the sun, the the, the inter that energy generation is only happening about ten percent of the mass of the star. That's true. And that is less than a percent of the mass of uh, so to make a helium nucleus, you, you lose 0.7 percent of the mass of those four hydrogen nuclei. So that's less than a percent of 10 percent of the star. So we're talking about, uh, I don't know, what it's like. what's a percent of 10 percent? Uh, one in a thousand. Yeah. So you're talking about one, one one thousandth of the sun's mass will be lost over its entire main sequence lifetime to that radiation. So we're not yeah. talking about that. So and, and in the solar wind, you're going to lose a comparable amount. But it, the real mass loss happens. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's, much more that's a good point. Yeah, that's why nuclear energy is such a wonderful thing, right? You hardly lose, it takes hardly any change in mass to generate a huge amount of energy. Um, okay. Well, let's look at some of the models you guys computed. So, unfortunately, I didn't get around to labeling it with everybody's name. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I only. I, didn't, I only had so many hours to spend on my script uh, to do this. But, you know, so this is the z equals 0.02, but whoever did the lowest mass one, was it 0 0.3? 0 0.3 is the lowest mass one? I can't remember. Is it 0 0.7? 0 0.5? Whatever. Anyway, if you did the lowest one, this is you uh, with that metallicity, and this is the next one, and this is probably 1.1, and up here would be 30. Uh, and then I guess 26, and then 16. So anyway, you can kind of count and see where yours probably is. Uh, obviously, I wished I'd put a mass in here. Um, so anyway, this is what it looks like for Z equals um, 0.02 metallicity. And if you notice, the scale goes from 3.4 to 4.6. Nothing changed. Oh, haha. -ha. So if you label the different points on the evolution, I just put labels on here. You sent me the history files so I could look through the history files and see where hydrogen burning equaled the surface luminosity, and that's here on this model, A. And let's see, where the heck is B? Oh, probably didn't get to B on that model. No, it's on. Is it? 
Well, this B, I'm pretty sure, goes with this yellow curve. Uh, oh, that one? Yeah. Oh, yeah, thanks. Thanks. So anyway, yeah, if we, if we look at the yellow curve or something, here's an A. So hydrogen burning, main sequence, exhaust hydrogen go up here. Didn't get any farther. Um, let's see. Let's pick one where we did get farther. Um, like this one here. A starts here, and then you got, no, it didn't. <laughs> Let's see, okay, A starts here, B, and then pretty sure C is here, and then D is back down here. And for the high mass guys, um, the thing that really sticks out to me is the low mass guys have this flat spot here, and then they go up, and the high mass guys just go back and forth. They're kind of horizontal. All the evolution is left to right, and they don't really change their luminosity very much. Now, if we look at the uh, z equals zero case, yeah, ignore the big green spike. <laughs> not sure what happened here. <laughs> I'm not saying it's wrong, but uh, suspicious. So Houston says a no right there yeah, really, really suspicious. Don't know what's going on, but let's not focus on the one weirdo. Um, so there that is. One thing to note is the other, the other uh, this is e equals zero. Um, this goes from 3.4 to 5, and the other one only went to 4.6. So these stars up here are a lot hotter than those other stars. So when we turned down, when we turned the metallicity to zero, all of a sudden the stars got hotter. And it turns out that that's true. That's what you would expect. Um, Z equals zero corresponds to like the first stars that would ever form in the universe. You know, because there were no heavier metals that had been built in stars yet. And so the very first stars would burn hotter. It's, it's not a complicated explanation, but um, it, it's not entirely simple. Um, when you put metals in the atmosphere of a star, the metals absorb photons a lot. So they make the atmosphere more opaque. Well, the more opaque the atmosphere is, the larger the change in the temperature from the bottom to the top. So if you imagine the core of the star is the same temperature, um, if you have a large change in temperature between the core and the outside, then that results in a small temperature on the outside, so the star looks cooler. But if you turn down the opacity a lot by having zero metals, then the change in temperature between the center and the surface is less, and so the surface is actually just hotter. So as you turn down the metallicity, the stars burn hotter. Um, and it can be a lot hotter. It can be like twice as hot. So let's see. Here it is all labeled. So things, things again look pretty reasonable. Like, yeah, this it's crazy green one. I'm not sure what to do with. <laughs> so, what this? Yeah, but that's all early on. It's this. This is later on, and that's disturbing. Because, because here you go, a. And, and it does all this and does this dipsy doodle. <laughs> and then it finally exhausts hydrogen. <laughs> that's what B is, right? Yeah. That's, that's, like a, that's like the sub dwarfs where it's turning Yeah. You know what this? Because if this were a regular star for us, we'd call that the main sequence, right? So you'd say, well, it's still on the main sequence if it's anywhere from just starting to burn hydrogen in the core to just exhausting hydrogen in the core. And yet for this star, that covers this range, <laughs> you know? It's crazy. Um, but remember, this is z equals zero. No stars that are around today is this really true for. Um, well, and also the other thing is, let's see, this model is 0.3 solar masses. It's probably 100 trillion years old right here. So even if this is crazy thing is going to happen, we've never seen it before. So, you know, it doesn't matter. Anyway, just an interesting question. So that might be about all I have on that. Um, do you guys, do you guys have any questions that were bugging you as you ran Mesa, going, "Gosh, I wonder what blah is." Yeah, Adam. I asked you during the last <laughs> point where my brightness hydrogen burning exceeded the actual brightness of the star They don't have to track, they don't have to totally be in phase. So they tend to be the same. 
The hydrogen burning luminosity tends to be the luminosity, but it can be smaller and smaller and um, greater. and greater. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to think of an example. Imagine that this room were completely isolated and we were at, in the Antarctic, okay? And we had a heater in the room, and so the heater is producing a certain amount of heat. And if you measured all the heat leaking out of the room, it would equal to the heat that's being produced by the heater, right? Because we're in stasis. And then somebody goes to the heater and they turn it up hotter and then they turn it down colder and they turn it down hotter and they turn it up harder. Well, when you turn it up hotter, the amount of heat leaking out of the room does not change instantaneously. The whole room has to warm up first, right? Then it starts to leak out at the same rate as the new thing, but by then they've turned it back cooler. And so it's the same thing here. When you turn up the energy generation in the center of the star, it takes it a while to leak out the surface. So they are not going to track exactly. It's only when the star is sitting there in a nice static configuration that the energy generated here is really close to the energy radiated here. Okay? Is that clear? Well, in the white dwarf, we tend, the, so the difference with the white dwarf is it tends to have very little hydrogen burning. So the white dwarf is cooling off. It's not static in that sense. It just cools off. So that's why they evolve down like this. It's not burning at all, but what does burn? No, no. Because if the luminosity from burning were the same as the surface luminosity, then the star wouldn't cool off. It would be completely stable because then you're replenishing all the heat you're losing. In order, so the fact that the white dwarf cools off, by definition, means it's generating less energy than it's radiating. Any other questions? Um, I should mention, uh, um, you guys all seem to know this, or at least the ones who've, who've asked me, you can download Mesa and install it on your laptop. Um, I, I taught at a Mesa summer school last, uh, last summer, and everybody brought their laptop and everybody ran Mesa on it in, in one big auditorium. So it's not like it requires the fastest computers ever. Um, the computers we're using are actually on the slow side because they're about four years old. So if you have a laptop that's one or two years old, it can probably run Mesa just fine. So if you're interested in that, um, we will probably have some projects that involve running Mesa. Uh, well, not just running Mesa, but doing stuff with Mesa. Um, so, if you're interested in that, you might go ahead and, and see about installing it on your laptop because the beauty of the laptop is you can be at home and you can say, okay, I'm just going to go to bed and let it run. Whereas on these computers upstairs, that's either impolite or dumb, you know? <laughs> so, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to do stuff like that. All right, any other questions, guys? Yes? Could, uh, could you help me troubleshoot it now that I'm pretty much done with the solution? Yeah, the thing to do is... Uh, Bring it to us, say, during lab hours. Or if you're really detail-oriented, then send us an email with all the information in it. It needs to have the information of the SDK that you installed, the version, the version of Mesa you installed, and the error messages from the terminal when you tried to install it. Okay. We need all that stuff. Otherwise, we can't do it. It's not an installation problem. It's the uh, make problem. So I'm already at the Mesa, star, Mesa work directory. Oh, it's just not making? Oh, okay, that, that's, that's pretty simple. But I can't tell you what it is. It could be one of 20 things. So just bring it in, and we can have a look at that. Yeah, Kevin, what? I have a couple Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and did you have a crazy announcement about meeting in a different room next week or not? Okay.